This is about uh, vertebrate organogenesis. And uh, so vertebrate organogenesis uh, takes place after the phylotypic stage. And so uh, at the phylotypic stage, uh, we have a neural tube formed induced by a notochord in all vertebrates. And uh, so here's the phylotypic stage where all vertebrates have a similar body plan, a similar very early embryonic architecture with a neural tube and notochord, somites, lateral plate, mesoderm, forming a silomic cavity and so forth. And then we go on to organogenesis, and this is where vertebrate body plans start to diverge. Um, so for example, organogenesis is referring to internal organs, and we see a lot of diversity. All vertebrates have a heart but there are quite a few different uh, forms of the heart, a two-chambered heart, three-chambered heart, four-chambered hearts, like that. So there's kind of tremendous diversity in the kidneys and the kidney development and so forth, and the lungs and so forth, right? Fish don't have lungs, right? Because we always want to remember that fish are included, and there's a fish in the phylotypic, in the phylotypic stage and then as vertebrates uh, going on and being very different. Uh, in organogenesis, uh, limbs are also considered organs. Uh, they develop at the same time, and so uh, vertebrate limbs are considered organs. And vertebrate limbs all are based, the lim limbs evolve, are understood to have evolved once in vertebrates, and so they have a really common architecture, and we are going to look at the very early embryo and how the different cells of the embryo uh, get going and get to participate in the limbs. Because uh, organ development usually involves a, you know, a variety of different, some different cell types, sometimes just two different cell types teaming up to create, start to create uh, a, a tissue uh, or, or a structure like that. <clears throat> and so we're going to be looking at that. And again, there's tremendous diversity uh, within vertebrates because we have the uh, limbless fish and then we have limbed vertebrates. And the limbed vertebrates are all uh, built on the same uh, evolutionary plan like that. It appears to have evolved once. And then I should just mention before I forget that limb evolution in vertebrates is profoundly different than limbs in invertebrates. So uh, fruit fly wings and fruit fly legs are completely different. It's as different as uh, you know, the development of uh, plants and animals, right? They're just completely different stories of genes and how the job gets done. So we're going to be looking at limb development. And um, uh, uh, oops, and just a close up of where we're at, organogenesis. And so uh, there's going to be quite a diversity, but we're just looking at the start of the limb and, um, and, um, and then recognize that based on at the start of the limb, we see a lot of uh, diversity. For example, limbs. Right? And this is a famous image of how the bones in, a, in all vertebrates limbs are homologous. So limbs evolved once and then uh, diversified in the details of their structure of the bones and muscles and so forth in those limbs, right? We have quite diverse limbs from flippers to wings to uh, legs to uh, hands with regard to the forearm, forelimb <coughs> of all vertebrates, right? Put a bat in there too, right? Oh, that is a bat. Uh, put a bird in there too, right? Like that, okay? And uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about, and we're going to draw it. Yep. Okay. And so the drawing is going to start out, it's going to look like this. The first drawing is going to be look like this, where we're going to have a fish. So that's a fish. That's the back fin of a fish. And we're looking down at it. <coughs> so we have the anterior posterior axis. And then we have, we'll have a human. So uh, there's going to be a limb. Okay. <clears throat> and um, we have our common view at the phylotypic stage is to cut the organism right here and look in cross section and talk about um, the neural the notochord and it's going to be inducing the <clears throat> neural tube and uh, we're going to create these uh, somites and that's the first thing I'll draw here so just to keep track of that because we want to talk about those so we got somites like that bilateral, bilateral somites and those are present in both the fish and the human and all vertebrates, okay? Then we have this lateral plate mesoderm, okay? And that's here. And the lateral plate mesoderm is the first thing I'm going to label because we're going to talk about that a bunch. So in the lateral plate mesoderm, it starts out like a tube running the length of the axis like that. I'll just sketch that in lightly. And it's present in fish and humans and all vertebrates. And then in this chest and uh, you know stomach region like that, the torso, it hollows out in all vertebrates to form the salomic cavity. 
and then uh, well, that's the phylotypic stage, and um, so it's going to hollow out here. And then we learned that uh, there's this somatopleura and then this splanchnopleura, and the splanchnopleura is going to be really important in uh, limb development and quite a diversity of uh, the details of the limbs, uh, uh, sorry, organ development, uh, different organs, organs like that. We have the same organs, but some different uh, uh, features in their development of the heart and so forth. Okay, so that's the lateral plate mesoderm, and you see, oh, it's prominent in organogenesis, right? plays a big role in organogenesis, so we want to talk about that a lot, and it plays a big role in limbs. Now, the next thing I want to show is that here's lateral plate mesoderm that is beyond the salomic cavity, right? So, the big role for lateral plate mesoderm in the salomic cavity. Next, big role for the lateral plate mesoderm in limb development. And uh, we're going to start out with the limbs in a very early st uh, stage of development, they're just going to start to grow out. So now I'm just going to redraw this, and very early, we don't have a limb, we just have a little bump. And that little bump is starting to form because the lateral plate mesoderm is proliferating. And the bud is going to grow out to become a limb, more and more, like that. And as it does, the lateral plate mesoderm is growing out with it. So the lateral plate mesoderm is going to be here to start with, and the lateral plate mesoderm isn't moving, it's not migrating rather, the cells are staying in place, but their progeny are behind them, right? So they've produced these cells and that's just pushing this out. So the growth is occurring in the distance uh, of the limb and we're getting that produced in the back, okay? And that's what we're going to talk a lot about and that's true for every vertebrate limb is the limb bud is formed. I'm just going to draw this from an angle down here what this would look like down here when we do this cross-section is the limbs from this view actually look like uh, the early limb looks like a little pancake. So it's, it's got some width to it, but it's got a flat pancake shape. And we get these um, lateral plate mesoderms growing out uh, near the tip of it and leaving behind uh, their cells. And that's the early step in limb development is the proliferation of this lateral plate mesoderm. And it's significant to see the architecture of vertebrates because you can see that there is sort of a kind of a natural opportunity in evolution to build limbs, right? And the limbs are at the, you know, just beyond the anterior end of the salomic cavity and posterior end of the salomic cavity. So we don't see vertebrates walking, crawling, flying around that have uh, limbs coming out from the center of the body. We also don't see them with more than four limbs, right? It's kind of an evolutionary constraint, but also kind of an evolutionary opportunity we have like that. And we can see that the fish have that lateral plate mesoderm and just did not evolve uh, the capacity for that to grow out and form limbs. Really early limbs were probably really simple bumps that fish, you know, some types of fish use to kind of hustle around on the bottom of the, in the bottom of the water, okay? All right, so in starting to talk about this, <coughs> we want to talk about the um, axes of the limb, okay? And so in the limb, we're going to have a new axis, and it's like this. And uh, that axis is named the proximal distal axis. And so when we're close to the body, we're proximal, and then further out on the limb, we're distal. So that lateral plate mesoderm is growing out more and more to produce more and more distal structures. The earliest structures are the proximal structures, like our shoulder, and then our elbow, and then our wrist. The lateral plate mesoderm is growing out in that dimension. So we have this new axis that uh, emerges, and let's just put that onto the uh, body axes too, right? We've talked about anterior, posterior, and then we've talked about dorsal, ventral. Something we haven't talked about is within the body, there's the midline, and we could be close to the midline or further away from the midline in this axis, and this is called medial when you're close to the midline, closer to the midline, and lateral. And those are always relative, like this is more medial than, th this is more medial and that is more lateral. It's relative, wherever you are, you're always either more or less medial and lateral. <coughs> so that's different uh, than proximal, distal, medial, lateral, refers to inside the body. So fish have medial, lateral dimensions, they don't have a proximal, distal axes, like that, okay? So we actually have 
three axes in the limb that we want to learn about. We have the proximal distal axis, we want to have the anterior posterior axis, and we want to have the dorsal ventral axis within the limb. Okay? All right, so the next thing I'm going to do is erase this and write those out because we want to understand the three uh, axes and what's responsible for the development of the three axes. So we're just going to put this in as a generic every limb, every vertebrate limb grows out as a limb bud. You know, might make a wing, flipper, hand, leg, like that. Okay? So first axis, proximal distal axis. And um, um, developmental biologists say that um, that the proximal distal axis is based on how uh, the cells, how old they are. There are uh, older cells back here at the proximal end and more distal, and I just described that. This growing region of the lateral plate mesoderm is called the, uh, um, oops, sorry, progress zone. So that patch of cells that are proliferating. And so what scientists like to say is that the proximal distal axis is based on time in the progress zone. And so they would say that the region of your shoulder, the cells are older, they spent less time in the progress zone. So progress zone represents proximal as older, distal as newer. And uh, time in the progress zone is synonymous to just simply saying that the more proximal thing cells are older and the more distal are younger. Then uh, anterior posterior axis. <coughs> <coughs> Every limb is based on this. There's a set of cells that are on the, in the posterior end of the limb, and uh, they're referred to as the polarizing region. And uh, they are releasing um, sonic hedgehog, which is functioning as a signaling factor and a morphogen. So different concentrations of sonic hedgehog cause different responses in target cells. So these are the source cells called the polarizing region, and they're releasing sonic hedgehog, and we have a concentration gradient from anterior to posterior. The famous way to describe how that works is to just draw out our hand, and in our hand, the thumb is uh, anterior, and then the index finger, middle finger, ring finger, pinky. And... Um, the finger digit identity is based on how much sonic hedgehog is seen by these target cells. And that's true for the entire limb, but it's clear in the hand because of you know the details of the digit. So the pinky sees the highest sonic hedgehog, the thumb sees the lowest. And that sets up the anterior posterior uh, axis all along the limb, you know, from shoulder to fingertips and every vertebrate like that. Then the last axis we want to talk about is the dorsal ventral axis of the limb and uh, that's set up by what's called the overlying ectoderm. And I'll just draw it by drawing the, the limb out in this cross-section way where it looks like a more of a pancake type structure in the early limb like that. and. Um, the body already knows more dorsal ectoderm, and that just gets kind of stretched out, grows out with the limb, and also more ventral. And so these uh, <coughs> ectodermal cells, they release uh, signaling factors that set up uh, concentration gradients across the limb that tell the cells inside whether they're dorsal ventral. What cells? What cells are being told? And, it's, and the answer is it's these, <coughs> the uh, progress zone cells, so the LPM progress zone cells that are growing, and then this product, the product cells. And these product cells are learning the axes, and they have the information for everybody else. Because this is not all the cells in the limb. It's just one kind of cells, and it's cartilage. So the lateral point mesoderm is mesoderm, and it can make uh, you know bones and muscles, right, of the body, and uh, and it's making cartilage here. 
So uh, as the limb grows out, this is just really kind of a big solid chunk of cartilage, and I'm just going to regrow, uh, redraw this. So here's a limb bud just to make it bigger, and we've got the axes, and that could be a question on an exam. Uh, you know, what uh, how are the three axes in all vertebrate limbs uh, uh, determined? And uh, time in the progress zone, exposure to sonic hedgehog from the polarizing region, and overlying ectoderm for the dorsal ventral axis. Okay, so we have these cells here, <coughs> and this is the first event. So people call this an early. This is an early event, and we're just making a big chunk of cartilage. All right, <coughs> and um, the cartilage makes extracellular matrix and it's making different extracellular matrix over time and uh, we're getting proximal to distal based on time in the progress zone the older cells are making certain types of extracellular matrix components and we get rich information laid down by this then the progress zone cells are seeing this um, exposure to sonic hedgehog so we're getting the anterior posterior sam sam sample cells so there's differences in the in extracellular matrix in this dimension and in that dorsal ventral dimension. And it's full of information. Uh, the extracellular matrix cells, um, molecules are not moving around. If they were formed approximately, uh, they're staying approximately, okay? Because uh, then we have later events. After this is going, you know, and, and, and doing this, it's really set up the plan for the limb. And uh, even though we're looking down, I'm going to just draw this a little more like it's the side uh, to fit this in. Because back here, um, we have um, other lateral plate mesoderm back here. And then we also have um, the somites back here. So here are some somites. And all the muscles in the limb are going to come from the somites and they're going to come from a region called the myotome. The myotome makes the muscles in the body, uh, like in the ribs and stuff, it makes the bones in the body too. In this case, it's just going to make the muscles and the cells obviously have to migrate. And when the cells are migrating, they look just like a neural crest cell drawing where they're moving out by chemotaxis. And they move out to the limb and they are becoming myoblasts. They're proliferating, increasing their cell number. And they use the extracellular matrix uh, to find places to start to differentiate as muscle. And they find attachment sites for the muscle to start forming tendons and ligaments and so forth. And that information is provided by the details within that extracellular matrix material. So we start to get muscles and the muscles start to just uh, randomly uh, twitch because they are differentiated, they can contract, and they do, even though they aren't innervated yet. And they start to contract and twitch, and that causes the limb to just, you know, wiggle slightly like that. It was a kind of a soft, gelatinous uh, kind of cartilage-like material. And what happens is um, we start to get some <coughs> mechanical stress here because the muscles are moving and it's starting to wiggle that. And that is going to start to establish where we're going to have a joint, like our elbow joint. We get the muscles set up, they start to twitch, and they start wiggling, and, and, and that uh, um, causes mechanical stretch in this, these cartilage cells. And uh, we're going to have a joint there. And so we start to establish where uh, we are eventually going to form uh, the joints and also, therefore, uh, the bones. Um, these cells that are here um, are really a solid chunk of cells, uh, so eventual bones, late, right? So early, get that cartilage laid down, lots of information, then uh, next thing is uh, some muscles start to form, we start to get the, the, the that mass wiggling, and uh, pretty soon we start to differentiate and, <coughs> um, uh, and form bones. So I'm just talking about the bones a little bit, and um, the um, um, and I'll just uh, try to draw this in like this, where um, I'll just say you know it's just a solid piece like that, and these cells that are here 
are uh, chondrocytes, cartilage cells, and it's a chunk of cells like that. There are cells on the outside, and then there are cells in the inside. The cells on the outside are called the perichondrium, and they, all the cells are chondrocytes, cartilage cells producing extracellular matrix, like that. Okay? And uh, so then uh, another event happens, and what happens is we start to get blood vessels growing in here. The limb is still tiny, 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 but we need a blood supply. And so here comes some blood vessels and um, going out and branching into this growing tissue. And some of the blood vessels uh, branch into here and branch into the interior of this and um, are going to uh, carry some of the perichondrium cell, perichondrial cells uh, into the middle of this mass of chondrocytes. And these perichondrial cells start to differentiate and form bone cells. And so I'm going to show you a couple slides of that. There are a couple slides forward, so we're just going to skip a couple things for the moment and come back to them. And uh, here's just an image from a review where we start out uh, early on and we have um, um, these cartilaginous cells and uh, they're surrounded by this perichondrium and uh, <coughs> they start to uh, uh, form early parts of what's going to be uh, regions uh, where bone will grow. But the key thing is that when the blood vessels start to uh, form and uh, grow into this mass of cells, they carry some of these perichondrial cells in and they're going to start to differentiate into uh, bone cells, uh, which are called osteoblasts. And so blood vessel development, uh, that's blood coming in, of course, we need that. But it also is going to help start to transition the cartilage into bone. And we're going to build uh, these growth regions, growth plates in the bones, and, and start to form calcified bone. Okay. I'm just going to show you this. We don't have to learn anything off this slide. Uh, what it's showing is that uh, we have uh, these skeletal precursors, and uh, they can differentiate into um, uh, yeah, chondrocytes uh, or osteocytes, um, depending on their location, like that. And uh, so we have these early guys, and they would be out in the perichondrium and then they're going to move in and differentiate into bone cells like that okay this just shows that there are lots of transcription factors and signaling factors as these cells are making these plants go down these developmental pathways uh what are the story here is the stories are a lot like muscle differentiation where we have a set of genes like myod and myogenin and so forth heading down this pathway to form uh cartilage and bone okay and uh so that's what I just wanted to show about that. And then we're going to go back here. And uh, so we start to get bone. And so let's just erase this and say <coughs> that out in this limb, we've got some stuff going on. And what we want to do is we want to be able to describe the cell types and where they came from. So the lateral plate mesoderm is going to produce this progress zone and the progress zone is going to produce cartilage cells that are going to go on to be cartilage and bone. So that's where bone is coming out of the deal, is from the lateral plate mesoderm. That's who makes it. Then we have, from the somite, cells crawling in that are going to make the muscle. So we've got cartilage, bone, muscle, and um, then we also have cells growing in to be blood vessels. and the timing of their growth. Initially, it's just the progress home making uh, just kind of a gelatinous um, clump of uh, cartilaginous cells. Okay, <coughs> so we have a couple more things we want to say, and that is that after the muscles uh, have differentiated, they start twitching, and uh, pretty soon, they start to get innervated with uh, nerves that are going to regulate their um, division, cell division, like that. and the cells for these are called neurons so all the nerve cells in our body are called neurons and uh, the neuron has a uh, nucleus that's where the cell body is 
and um, the, you know, the cell is really there. And then it grows this out and um, it's going to grow out and find this target. And uh, um, motor neurons are all inside the CNS. So inside the spine or the brain, that's where they are. So they're the cells that are the nerve cells that regulate muscle contraction in our limbs are in the CNS. <clears throat> then we can also have the sense of touch. So we have another set of nerve cells and those sense of touch nerve cells are not in the CNS, they're in the PNS. And the PNS is these organized dorsal root ganglia between every vertebral column in the, you know, along the midline where our spine is. And so this is dorsal root ganglia. And the cell bodies for our sense of touch are here. And they send a process out that can detect touch or like the location of where our limb is in space. And so of the nerves in our limbs, in every vertebrate limbs, the nerves are motor neurons. Oh, I didn't even write that down. Let's get that written down. Neurons that cause muscle to contract are called motor neurons. And then these, and they're in the central nervous system. And then we have these guys, and they're called sensory neurons. And they're in the dorsal root ganglia. And that's part of the peripheral nervous system. The motor neurons are part of the central nervous system. Okay, and uh, the um, um, and those are the things that we want to be able to describe in a test. Is to draw this out and explain that uh, you know the early event is the lateral plate mesoderm dividing to form the eventual cartilage and bone of the uh, of the limb, and also the extracellular matrix to really guide everybody else. Then uh, the myoblasts come migrating in from the somites, and uh, that's their origin. So I should have written that up here too. Is have a little block up here and say that we get uh, um, these uh, uh, in the somite. The cells that can make muscle are called myotome, and those myotome cells start to migrate out into the limb, and those are myoblasts migrating, just like uh, no, a crest cell looks like when it's migrating, and they find the spots for attachment, and they differentiate into muscles there. And uh, so um, then um, we're going to make um, uh, joints, and so we'll just write that down as if they're uh, you know, another cell type, but just the idea of a joint. And then we have uh, blood vessels coming in, and they carry uh, perichondrial cells in and start to form bone. Then we get uh, motor neurons coming in and connecting and helping the cells start to contract in a controlled, coordinated way <coughs> when the baby starts to kick. And we also have sensory nerves coming in so that the baby can feel stuff uh, when they're kicking, like that. And so that's that. Okay, uh, the last piece I want to talk about is I want to go back to the axes and talk about at the molecular level a little bit about what's happening. And so um, what we see is if we go back to that drawing of looking down at a fish and human and every other vertebrate like that, um, we have um, these somites, and they're just numbered, and uh, there are somites that are in the region of the forelimb, and those somites are responsible for sending the muscle cells out to limb. They're also responding for building the shoulder, shoulder blade, scapula, collarbone, right? So a big role for uh, development to occur inside the limb for the forelimb and then the hind limb where we have uh, the hip and uh, pelvic girdle and so forth like that. And so that's a big part of it. And although fish don't have limbs and they don't have shoulders or pelvic girdles, they have somites. And we learned that the, the somites are just numbered from anterior to posterior. They're different. That's how we set up uh, the uh, body plan in vertebrates. And um, their identity, their location, is based on the Hox genes. And that's true for 
um, fish and um, uh, limbed vertebrates like us. So the role for the Hox gene in establishing identity along the anterior posterior axis is called ancestral. That's an evolutionary term that means uh, original or old. So there's an ancestral role for the Hox gene that we learned about. Uh, you can have homeotic mutations that cause a change of address. You have homeotic mutations that lead to the vertebrae in the neck growing limbs because they have the wrong address. Okay, so that's the ancestral condition. <coughs> and um, then when limbs evolved, there's a new role for Hox genes in the limb. So original role, Hox gene, uh, shoulder, uh, pelvic girdle. Also, Hox genes say this is going to be a forelimb, hind limb. Hox genes, where to locate these limbs on the anterior posterior axis. And so that's true. And, and, um, and fish already had that plan, and we just built on it when we built uh, limbs. Okay, So then there's this new role for the Hox genes and it is in the limb, and so that's going to be a new role. <coughs> in the limb development, and the, in evolution, that's called a derived, derived role, a more modern role. And so we have, you know, every cell has all the genes, and so, you know, the uh, Hox genes can be uh, activated and play the ancestral role, and they can be activated and play this derived role. And the Hox genes play a role in the patterns of the limb, and so the Hox genes are especially important in this new proximal distal axis. And, um, but they also play roles in the um, anterior posterior axis and the dorsal ventral axis. And there are new roles. They're transcription factors, they're homeotic genes, they're homeotic genes um, in the body, and um, um, also um, they can play a homeotic role in the limb. Um, so I just want to show you some slides about that. And they're back here. And so <coughs> um, just to uh, follow up on these, Here's that um, progress zone that's going to grow out in the lateral mesoderm. Here's the polarizing region. Um, a little bit of a detail is that the progress zone is at the distal tip of the growing limb, like we learned, and over it is this blue cell, these blue cells that are referred to as the apical ectodermal ridge. They're called a ridge because when you look at the limb from the side, it looks like a pancake. And we have this edge where the apical ectodermal ridge is, and then this inner part where the um, progress zone is. And um, the apical ectodermal ridge releases uh, signaling factors that are growth factors that stimulate limb development. And so along the length of the body, of the organism, it's actually the positioning of the apical ectodermal ridge that leads to a stimulation of limb development and a pretty prominent role in limb development. Okay, and uh, so just uh, just some orientations on that, and um, uh, um, and then um, here's the Hox genes, and the Hox genes have uh, complex gene expression patterns. Back here in the body. The Hox gene gene expression patterns are pretty simple. You know, we have some Hox genes expressed more anteriorly and some more posteriorly than the overlap, and they give kind of a house address, like 122 Main Street, because these Hox genes are expressed all together in those cells. In the limb, we see a lot more of a dynamic and s sort of strange um, distribution of gene expression. Uh, the Hox D cluster plays an especially important role, but um, uh, um, um, there are other genes as well. So let's take a look at the genes. So here's the story of the letters and the genes. There's Hox genes, and in fruit flies, there is one cluster of Hox genes. In all vertebrates, there are four. Some vertebrates have even more Hox gene clusters, but all vertebrates have four. The colors uh, show the orthologs, 
with the fruit fly genes. And then altogether, the numbers are paralogs, and the Hox genes are named by the numbering system. So scientists found that the Hox genes duplicated twice in evolution of vertebrates. So as we're heading toward the vertebrate um, uh, uh, organisms, uh, early there was a duplication of the Hox genes and then another duplication. So we have a total of four Hox gene clusters. That means that we have some redundancy, some overlap. So we could make this gene mutated and we m wouldn't maybe have a homeotic mutation visible because the other genes can cover for it. So in the ancestral role along the body plan in fish and all vertebrates, it's really unusual to find a homeotic mutation that leads to a transformation. Scientists kind of have to build those in lab by intentionally altering the various Hox genes. On the other hand, it's not all of these genes that play a role in the proximal distal axis of the limbs. And so this is colorized to show that uh, this gene is particularly important and evolved uh, new roles and they are in this proximal distal axis. Because of that, it's still rare, but if you have a mutation in Hox13, you have a birth defect and it's in the distal regions of the hands and the feet. Um, I actually grew up with a neighbor uh, next door, Mrs. Anfidson. Um, she was like my parents' age and lived with her mom. Um, and I'd say Miss Anfidson had mutation in her Hox 13, D13 gene because she had hands that uh, were formed sort of like this. Yeah, uh, next door neighbor. So rare, but uh, that can happen. And of course, uh, different mutations would give uh, different uh, limb deformities, uh, birth defects on the axis from proximal to distal in that, that way. So uh, we want to say about that, that we have uh, the ancestral Hox function uh, being maintained in vertebrates and then evolution showing us a new derived role for Hox genes. Every cell has all the genes, including all the Hox genes. And what if we activate them? What would happen? And in this case, it was a part of the evolution of the vertebrate limb. Roll for that. Okay, great. Uh, we're not reading the chapter, but our book shows this in the um, a Hox D gene cluster that they're expressed in the proximal to distal way like that. And uh, here's another view from uh, another figure just showing some of the different Hox genes. So pretty complicated story, but nevertheless a Hox story uh, that evolved in vertebrates that have limbs. Again, fish have these Hox genes. And it just seems like there was the duplications that left uh, some Hox genes sort of ready to play new derived roles in evolution, like that. <clears throat> and so um, we're set on that, and I think we're set for this uh, story. Uh, so we'll stop here. Thanks.